Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. This is Kim Greenhouse. I'm very excited today to learn new material about how climate change and weather has impacted human history. You know, so many of us today view the climate either as if we are causing it or we see it as cyclical. But either way, climate change and weather have caused conditions to be ripe for many battles and wars, for the onset of commercial invention and inventions of all kind that otherwise would not have come to pass, such as irrigation, clothing, many facets of agriculture. Climate change has caused many mass migrations to occur, and we don't think about this with today's fast-paced world. The role of weather and climate and our ability to prepare for sudden changes in our ability to live could never be more important than it is today. Dr. Tim Ball joins us to talk about why climate change and weather are important, not only for planning many of today's events and business endeavors around the world, but also for quality of life. He's also going to talk to us about how climate change and weather has impacted human history. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Tim Ball, welcome to It's Rainmaking Time. Well, thank you, Kim, and, and thanks for the opportunity. Well, first, give us a context of why is this relevant to understanding climate change and weather? Well, one of the things that um, I, I've done throughout my career, and it was really triggered by a singular event in, in my uh, academic history, it is to combine history and geography. Geography is the stage, and history is the play that's played out on that stage. And what's happened is that um, because of increasing specialization, they've been separated into uh, different disciplines. Now, you, you can study geography independently. You can study, study history independently. But you really don't understand the dynamics of them unless you put them together. And um, this um, uh, occurred uh, to me in a... Uh, I went back to university as a mature student, which, by the way, I think is the only way to go with some life experience. And I took a history course, and I wrote um, an, an essay about the impact of the um, weather changes and climate changes, particularly the um, two very severe weather years that caused complete harvest failure in France that was the catalyst for the French Revolution. Can you talk about that? Yeah, well, the enmity between the peasants and the aristocracy was always there. I mean, the, the class warfare is still going on, as you know. But every once in a while, something triggers a, a, a revolution where the, uh, the people rise up and say, no, we've had enough. And almost always, and I've done a lot of research on this, almost always, it's a failure of the food supply. And, but that, in today's world, tends to get ignored. For example, there's been all of this um, thing about Egypt and the uprising and Arab Spring and so on. What actually was going on in Egypt were riots over the cost of food. That's what really triggered it. And, and of course, once, it, once it, uh, you take that cork out of the bottle with the people on the streets, then other people get behind them and, and uh, there is a, a revolution in curse. Well, that's what, what happened in France with the harvest failures. And um, so um, this, this uh, idea uh, that I wrote about in, in the essay, uh, which got an F from the professor, because, of course, he accused me of digging up the old and nasty uh, ideas of environmental determinism and climatic determinism. Please don't assume we all get what that is. Explain what that is. The idea of it is that humans and human behavior and, and all of uh, everything is, is predetermined by the environment. Montesquieu and others had talked about it, and, and the Greeks had done some studying on it. But it was really um, a book by the title of Anthropogeography by a German uh, geographer, Friedrich Ratzel. And, of course, it was the idea that people's behavior is determined by the weather and climate that they experience. This went against the whole concept of human uh, freedom of thought and independence of thought and so on, which of course was uh, central to the whole uh, U.S. Constitution and, and the formation of the United States. And, and so this, this intellectual battle went on 
ironically, it was uh, two Americans that uh, were in the forefront of it. Ellsworth Huntington, for example, publishing books on climate and civilization and taking uh, Ratzel's ideas. And uh, Alan uh, Churchill Semple was another, uh, you know, writing about we're all children of Mother Earth and so on. But as I said, it ran against the concept of free will and freedom of thought and so on. The reason that the ideas of determinism were completely rejected was because Ratzel's ideas were picked up by a German general, Haushofer, who during the First World War saw what he thought was this determinism in the wars between uh, Japan and Russia in particular. He expanded the ideas And the sad part was that Haushofer had as an aide-de-camp a guy by the name of Rudolf Hess. He was Hitler's second-in-command. And by the way, nobody's ever explained why he stole an airplane and fled to Scotland. And he died in Spandau prison, still supporting Hitler. But anyway, these ideas of uh, people being determined by the climate and, and environment in which they were born and raised was incorporated into Hitler's ideas in Mein Kampf. And, of course, it led to the idea that people from uh, hot climates were lazy and indolent and stupid, and people in cold climates were aggressive, intelligent, and dominant, which, of course, is pure racism, the Aryan nation supremacy, white nation supremacy, which, of course, still lingers in our society today. And so after the Second World War, The whole concept of environment or weather or climate having an influence on human behavior and human history was totally taboo in the academic world. I remember Professor Fisher, who taught at the University of Durham, he came to Winnipeg where I was a student at the time, and the chairman of the department asked me, uh, the only student with a car, to drive him around Winnipeg to show him the sights. And I was showing him a a lawn bowling green, grass lawn bowling, is an English pursuit. And and, um, he said, I'm surprised to see that here with the climate that you had. And I said, oh, is that climatic determinism? And he went ballistic in my car. He said, don't mention those filthy words to me. And I, of course, I'm sitting there as a student. I I shut my mouth very quickly. But it it was my introduction to this whole idea of of what is now starting to be uh, acceptable as a topic of discussion, but the perversion of it by the academic world and then the politicians using those academic ideas for a political agenda. And, of course, it, it parallels what we're seeing with the, uh, the whole um, intergovernmental panel on climate change and the idea of uh, human fossil fuels destroying the climate and so on. So do you think that fossil fuels do not have an impact on the climate in any way or on weather or on the atmospheric system? Yeah, that's correct. It's the byproduct of fossil fuels, CO2, that they are pointing the finger at. So right. it's not the fossil fuels per se. And, of course, they divert the argument by pointing at coal and saying, well, coal is dirty. Well, yes, coal produces soot particles, which does have an an impact on on the uh, weather because um, it blocks the sunlight. And it also retains heat, so it both heats and cools. But you can burn coal perfectly clean with scrubbers. The argument that CO2 from fossil fuels, that is oil and gas, are changing the climate is scientifically incorrect. Okay, but wait, I want to just go back a little bit because you're deep in it and not all the listeners are going to be as far along. Okay. And particularly since most of us have been hypnotized about CO2 and two years ago when I learned about CO2 and people that have been studying it and working with it for 40 and 50 years, it was stunning to me that it's not a toxin at all. In fact, it's a form of nourishment for plants. But I want to go back to the fossil fuel part. I don't want to hit the CO2 part because that's a separate thing. And I don't want to get lost there with you. But with respect to fossil fuel processing, any type of mercury that gets put into the air and other types of chemicals in the processing of it, Are you saying that, at least at this point, there's no concern for that, or you're not aware of that, or you just disagree that that's not there, or none of the above? 
I know you said I shouldn't talk about CO2. No, that's fine. I just didn't want to get lost. No, I realize. But you see, one of the ways that they've muddied the water in the scientific debate about the burning of fossil fuels and it's causing global warming and or climate change is that, as you said, they argue that CO2 is a, is a a harmful substance as the EPA define it, or a toxic substance as the Canadian government define it. But it isn't. As you said, it, it's, it's essential to uh, plant life, which is, of course, uh, essential for oxygen production and therefore life on the planet. But the idea that, that in producing fossil fuels, you produce pollutants, that's a different, completely different issue. And people like Al Gore have deliberately muddied the air and the water with, with this. Okay, but you do agree, separate from CO2, that there are pollutants in the processing of fossil fuels and oil. Is that correct? Of course. Okay. Now, of course, it's a matter of whether you, how you define it. For example, you mentioned mercury. Well, mercury occurs naturally in the environment. In fact, one of the geologic processes and for locating um, lead and zinc is to sample the water, and as you get closer to the source, the mercury level increases. The, the real issue with any of these topics, Kim, and, and Paracelsus said this back in the 16th century. It's degree, isn't it? It's the matter of degree. Yeah. As he said, the toxicity is in the dosage. Right. The idea that you, you say, well, mercury is, is, is a pollutant depends upon how you're defining it. Although it is one of the most virulent toxins in the world, even at very, very small parts per million. Not necessarily. And again, you have to go back and look at all the research that was done. If you set out to show something is a toxin or a pollutant, then you start determining, well, what is the dosage? What is the part right. per million? On that one, I'm going to say I 100% beg to differ you on the mercury part. Don't get me wrong here. I'm not saying under certain concentrations, and those concentrations can be increased to toxic levels by human activity, such as the processing of fossil fuels, it becomes a pollutant or yeah, a problem. I understand. But it's a matter of, in all of these use of numbers and their production, you have to know what the levels of toxicity are. I mean, for example, I could show you, that, and, and I got into a lot of trouble in this, and I lived in Winnipeg, and I pointed out to people that there is arsenic in their drinking water. Right. A lot of people don't know that. Right. But the level of arsenic in the water, you could never live long enough or drink enough water to raise the level of arsenic in your body to, to, for it to become a problem. By the way, they knew in Winnipeg, because they've been sampling the water since 1907 to the present day, that the, the level had not increased. I understand you're saying there's naturally occurring levels of arsenic in water. Yeah. However... There's also a lot of chemicals, and I don't want to divert us again because we'll be all over the place, but right. there's a lot of chemicals that are also dumped into our water that don't occur naturally, that don't belong there. And that's a separate issue with respect to water. But it is about dosage. It is about dosage. I do want you to go back to the CO2 part and close right. that loop. And then I want to go back to how weather and climate have impacted human functioning in history. Let's uh, link it this way, uh, Kim. One of the things, of course, that in all of the discussion and all the points you've made, and to some extent in the responses I've made, is this assumption that whatever humans do is not natural. And that speaks to what we were talking about earlier, about climatic determinism, environmental determinism, and free will and all the rest of the things. You see, because uh, if, if what humans do is not natural, then that, Im that implies that humans are not natural. And if we're not natural, then what's the alternative? God put us here? Well, that's unacceptable to those people that believe in Darwin and evolution and so on. That's why the whole Richard uh, Dawkins and God is dead is still part of this whole debate. So what, what we're talking about here in terms of pollutants and what humans are doing and so on there are animals that do things that are problematic for other animals, right? For example, when a beaver builds a dam and floods a whole uh, valley, what does that do to the animals that were living there before the valley was flooded? So the impact of, of animals on, on other animals, why is human behavior seen as unnatural or any different? And of course, it goes back to this argument and the climatic determinism, environmental determinism, is part of that debate. 
and and so that this this is a, as I said, the whole concept of it um, uh, was thrown out because of what we were talking about with Ratzel's ideas being adapted by the politician Hitler to uh, forward his idea of racial superiority and and um, the the extermination of certain groups of people and and all the rest of it, and and of course it was also. Um, uh, at the center of the concept of uh, eugenics and Lysenkoism and all of these other ideas. So, uh, as I said, when I um, wrote this essay and dared to suggest that what had triggered the French Revolution was um, was weather events, the um, uh, you know I, I just got absolutely lambasted by the um, hi- history prof that was teaching the course. Now, what happened was I appealed it as a mature student. I didn't get bullied into taking the F. I appealed it to a committee and ended up with an A+, plus because I appeared before the committee and argued my case. And, and to their credit, they listened to my arguments. But um, uh, it, it led me in a pursuit of this idea of not only studying the extent of climate change and the reconstruction of past climates, but also the impact that those changes had on the human condition. And, and uh, so that was really uh, the theme of what, uh, what we were uh, going to talk about today. But it needs that philosophical and historical context so people understand where I'm coming from. Now, it isn't necessarily a direct weather event. Yes, there are weather events that kill people. Just look at the tornadoes that go through the U.S., for example, or hurricanes. But... Invariably, it's the impact upon food supply. That's that's the critical part of the whole uh, pattern of, of weather events, and um, such as the um, uh, the weather that created the conditions for the Irish potato famine, that killed off the potato that had become a primary food source. The same with the French Revolution, but in in the larger ter- scheme of things, it is climate changes, and this is where uh, the modern intergovernmental panel on climate change have got things wrong. They're only looking at temperature. The real issue in, in human history is what happens to the precipitation, because that's what determines the food production. And um, so you get, uh, it, it's no coincidence that in the year 2000, which was really the big, so the the, the uh, pivotal point of the beginning of the idea of weather and climate changes and their impact into the 21st century, where weather and climate are increasingly of concern. That uh, they asked to the 200 uh, famous uh, or famous, but meteorologists and climatologists to list the 20 worst climate disasters of the 20, uh, 20th century. Eleven of the 20 were droughts. And five of the 20 were floods. And so the idea that the temperature change is, is uh, important, uh, yes, on a, on, a, on a much larger scale, there's got to be quite significant temperature change before there's an impact. But in terms of precipitation, that's what's really important. Now, there were studies done in the U.S., for example, um, <clears throat> in, in, in Indi- I believe it was Indiana, where they interviewed farmers of different ages, you know, 60, 70, 80, even 90 years old, and asked them about individual years with regard to temperatures. They could only remember extremes if it was an exceptionally cold year or an exceptionally hot year. But when it came to precipitation, they could remember virtually every year. Because, of course, in, in, the, uh, in the year-to-year event and in the longer term, it's what the precipitation is going to do that really determines the food supply. When you say precipitation, do you mean rain or do you mean something else? No, precipitation incorporates any form of moisture that comes from the sky and falls on the earth. Of course, the, the major one is rain, but... You know, farmers in, in, in Europe and North America have a saying that, uh, you know, I never lost a crop in January. Well, that's not true. Uh, it's true if you don't have snowfall. But if you have snow, what happens with winter snow is very important for the moisture that's available for the crop to generate in the spring. 
But that I was provides in... the soil moisture. And, of course, the other thing, uh, Kim, and you raise a very, very important point. And I was also under the impression that snow damages crops, so I'm confused there, but go ahead. It depends upon when the snow occurs. W.O. Pruitt has done marvelous studies on, on the, the importance and value of snow in the whole ecology, snow ecology. And, and um, it, it, it can damage some crops, but I say it depends when it occurs. If, if, you get a, if you've got a crop and you get a snowfall and it protects the snow from a very hard frost, then the snow is beneficial. So it, it, it all depends upon uh, the pattern and the sequence and so on. But just to give you another example of precipitation, in 1984, Canada's uh, crop predictions were saying for a very poor crop across western Canada because it was it was quite dry. And uh, so they were forecasting for a below average harvest. When the harvest came in, it was average or above average in most areas. And they couldn't figure out why. Well, I went and studied why. And the answer was that at the end of August, the last two weeks of August and into the first week of se- September, which is when the crop is doing what the farmers call filling, um, they had a, a daytime highs of, of, of you know, fairly high temperatures for, for Canada anyway, uh, of around um, you know, 80 degrees. But at night, it was dropping down quite cold within, within a, a few degrees of freezing. Now, what that did was it meant that there was a great deal of condensation moisture deposited across the land on the plants and on the soil. And I calculated <clears throat> that in, in a couple of weather stations that I looked at, it was the equivalent of almost uh, two and a half inches of rainfall. But, of course, that isn't counted in the official government count of precipitation. Why? Well, because they don't record it. Do you know why it's not recorded other than the fact that it isn't? Well, because most of the weather service and weather data we collect came about because of uh, the need for weather forecasting in the First World War for flying. That's why most weather stations are at airports. But our needs for weather data, particularly in agriculture, are very different. It's something I've fought through my whole career. Talk about that. Well, you've set up a service for one particular need, but the needs have changed. The commercial airlines could could hardly care less what the weather is these days. They can land in virtually zero visibility. And 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 the only thing they're really concerned about is high-level winds um, because of of fuel consumption and also because of turbulence. And so they're looking for smooth air and tailwinds in order to give a smooth ride and reduce their fuel costs. Um, So... uh, uh, you know, the, the idea of importance of the weather to flying is virtually gone, but it's still, the data that we collect is still essentially for aviation. And it's only small aircraft that really care about the weather now. That if they can't get into a, they haven't got the instruments or the power to get into station, different, different uh, airports and so on. So the whole pattern of, of what's needed has shifted, but the service, the government service has not shifted. And, the, and a lot of, of agencies are setting up their own weather services. For example, Agriculture Canada is setting up its own weather stations. And, and um, the um, uh, utilities, the generation of power, uh, hydroelectric power, for example, they set up their own weather stations because they need much more accurate uh, rainfall and, and moisture and water availability charts. And so this idea that I that I measured and determined the amount of moisture from condensation, and you you put two and a half inches of moisture on a crop in in the late uh, stages of its development, that turns a crop from a below average crop into an average or above average crop, and that's that's precisely what happened. But the the government weather people go home at at five o'clock, but what happened overnight, and that condensation is much more widely distributed than rainfall. And not only that, but it's right at the uh, the ground level and, it, and is absorbed into the ground and it's absorbed by the plant overnight when the, the heat stress from the plant is reduced. And and so um, our measures of the uh, of what affects things are, are just totally inadequate. And of course, this is this is amplified by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change 
only looking at temperature change and really only looking at warming. They haven't even looked at the impact of cooling, which is much more devastating uh, for, for the world and for plants and animals and humans. So the distortions that have gone on um, because of, of past events, and of course, once you set up a system, and this is the problem with government, and we have talked about this before, once you set up a system, the system is rigid. And yet the uh, the dynamics of the world are constantly changing and the needs are changing and government doesn't change. It just it stays with the same old thing and does the same old thing until it's pe- it's all pensionable time, as is a favorite saying amongst government employees. And, and so the idea of the weather service, the data they collect, uh, the impact of it, I mean, some of the things that, that helped uh, with weather ser- services in the U.S., was uh, NASA suddenly became um, very concerned about what the weather was doing, and um, they were doing some very, very good research. I mean, a book by Herman and Goldberg published in 1979 called Sun, Climate, and Weather, a very, very uh, advanced book. But then NASA got caught up in the politics through James Hansen of the NASA GIS, and they got caught up in the IPCC and turned it into a political issue. And and, um, and NASA, of course, NASA's interest in the weather was, and it was accentuated by the way that the, the cold weather caused the, the crash of that uh, launch, you know, the, the cold shrinking the O-ring. Yeah, Here, yes, uh, yes. Remember, remember that? that? Yes. Was, that was a weather-related thing. Cloud cover, of course, is important for them. But the other thing is, and people don't know this, the depth of the atmosphere that is from the surface up to the top of the atmosphere, is determined by the global temperature because it's a gaseous envelope, and the warmer it is, the more it will expand, and the colder it is, the more it will shrink. I want to take you back to the weather stations. Yes. You have lectured a lot and done speaking engagements to farmers around the country, several countries, and they look to you for guidance. I understand something's being set up in Canada but what would you suggest to people in different countries who are farmers who need to rely on the accurate, and I want to repeat, accurate data? Since Anthony Watts found out that a lot of the weather stations in America were not updated, they were not fixed, they were put in locations that were showing a persuasion to warming. So my question to you is, can farmers be involved in this or not really? Oh, definitely. Um, and, and one of the things that, um, uh, that will help this, uh, and whenever I talk to a farm group, I say, look, you know the weather on your farm better than I do. Uh, you, you, you experience it, you live with it, you have the history of it, you're aware of it. And I mentioned the story about knowing the precipitation pattern over the years. And farmers um, have, have, have empirical knowledge. For example, across Canada, you ask them, when do you plant? They say May the 10th. Uh, pretty well across the country. When you say, why do you do that? They say, well, dad's always did it. I always did it that way. What they don't realize is that if you look at the record after May 10th, the risk of frost increases significantly or decreases, I should say. So what they've evolved is a planting sequence that's based upon the long-term climate pattern. Farmers know you never plant your crop on the basis of last year's weather because the weather can be so variable from one year to the next. And um, so, but but in order in order to what what I advise the farmers to do, and they can do it very cheaply, is get their own automatic weather station. You can get them. Uh, in fact, ironically, Anthony Watts sells them. Right. And and you can set them up in uh, around your farm, and and you can have them uh, the information. Uh, directed into your computer in your farm, and you, so you can and set up a, a, a monitor on what's actually going on your farm. For example, one of the things that a farmer needs to do is measure the temperature right at the ground, because the official government weather uh, temperature is measured about four and a half feet above ground level, and the temperature at four and a half feet above ground level is very different than the temperature right at the surface. So if you're basing your, your pattern on, on what the government temperatures are telling you, that's at four and a half feet above the ground, which is actually, other than for corn, is generally above, above most crops. And, and so if you set up, and, and what you need to do then is, is to uh, set up a, a, you know, some sort of mapping so you know where the low spots are on your farm, where the frost is more likely, the cold air draining down there. 
um, and, and, and the changing in precipitation pattern, because even a few feet in elevation can create a very different microclimate, even on the prairies, on the plains. And, and so what, once you've got a, a, your own local weather station, then you can compare that with the official, the, the closest official government station, see the differences. And then what you need to do is look at the government-produced weather maps, but turn the sound off. Turn, look at your local <laughs> weather Turn the sound off, and then just watch. And the most important thing for uh, mid-latitude farmers in Canada and the U.S. is what the jet stream is doing. And uh, you watch the pattern of that jet stream, um, and, and then um, over time you'll start to realize that there's approximately a five-week cycle to your weather. And then you apply that to your to the local conditions on your farm, and you'll get a much much better understanding of the dynamics of what's going on. So when I talk to the farmers, I say, "Look, you know the weather on your farm better than I do, but what I can do for you is is show you the larger picture." What about Europe? The only difference in Europe is that it is so influenced by the Gulf Stream, more correctly, the North Atlantic Drift. And that's only got a shift by one or two degrees. Now, when you say the Gulf Stream, you don't mean that is the same as the jet stream, do you? No, it's equivalent to the jet stream in a way because it's a large movement of water in that case, as opposed to air, which is the jet stream from west to east. And, and in fact, the, the surface ocean currents are driven by the winds, not specifically by the jet stream because it's up above the surface. But the jet stream is part of what are called the westerlies which in the latitudes that essentially cover the United States and Europe from about 30 degrees to 65 degrees, that westerly movement of air brings you the weather patterns and the jet stream waves that create the weather patterns that you experience. And um, so the only thing that the Gulf Stream does is that it transports heat from the tropical region of the Gulf of Mexico up along the east coast of the United States and uh, then it's it, uh, transported across the ocean. And, uh, I mean, compare, for example, the Russian port of, of Murmansk, uh, which is at 70 degrees north. Compare that with uh, Alaska. And yet Murmansk is ice-free port year-round. And, and it's because of the warm water transported in by the, uh, by the Gulf Stream. And, of course, there was a great scare put up about, oh, the Gulf Stream's weakening and it's going to die and uh, it's going to be a, you know, cause all kinds of ructions. And it, the, the technical term for it, if people want to look it up, is the thermohaline circulation was being affected. And now the European pattern of weather is... is um, I want to go back to that. Are you saying you don't, you're not concerned about that? No. Why? Well, because all of the experts that I read on it, the, the people that study ocean currents and have studied all of these things and, and my, own, my own experience of studying it, because, for example, uh, I was looking back in the 1970s at changes in the, uh, in the ocean currents and the weather on the east coast of North America because of the decline of the cod population, where the Canadian government actually banned cod fishing in the, in the province of Newfoundland. Um, I mean, and that's like going into Kansas and saying you can't grow grain anymore. The only thing that saved that economy in that province was they discovered oil off the coast. Without the oil uh, discovery, but Newfoundland would be a, an absolute welfare case. But what caused the decline of the cod wasn't the overfishing. It was that the water temperatures were dropping because the Labrador current, the cold current that comes down from Greenland on the east side of Greenland, was pushing down and lowering the water temperatures, and the cod migrated. Now, we were talking earlier about uh, the theme of our talk here is the effect of climate on history. These, these patterns of, of uh, changes in, in the water temperatures and the salinity of the water have occurred throughout history. For example, a lot of the migration out of Western Europe, particularly um, in, in Scotland and, and uh, the Scandinavian countries in, into uh, uh, Minnesota and so on, occurred because of a collapse of the herring and the cod fisheries at the end of the 19th century. And it, it, and it was, uh, for example, um, uh, many of the people that came from um, the Orkney Islands 
was which was booming in the 1850s, but by 1880 it had gone into deep decline because the, the herring and the cod had moved. It wasn't overfishing. It was the water temperature that changed. Perhaps the most dramatic one in Western European history, at least, was that as the uh, temperatures cooled, after the medieval warm period, around 1000 AD, water temperatures started to cool. And in Europe, the temperatures started to drop. And it also got an increase in, in precipitation. So it got cooler and wetter. And what that did was it changed the water salinity of the whole of the Baltic Ocean or Baltic Sea. Now, the Baltic Sea is effectively cut off from the, the main oceans. It is, it is saline, but by the time you get to um, uh, St. Petersburg, um, the, the salinity is, is very, very low. And, um, uh, but so if you get an increase of, of precipitation, increase of fresh water running into the Baltic, the salt level declines, the water temperature declines, and the herring, which were the main food supply that maintained what was called the Hanseatic League, which is, which is a great commercial um, adventure along the Baltic coast and North German plain and so on, um, was built upon the herring fisheries. Now, the herring disappeared, and of course, that led to uh, uh, a collapse of the Hanseatic League uh, and the economy declining. And I, by the way, happen to think that that also um, uh, put pressure on and uh, facilitated the uh, Protestant Revolution. Because if, and again, I've looked at a lot of this. If you look at, if Martin Luther had, what, had said what he said, even 20 years earlier, the, the princes would have had him executed. Okay? Because what Martin Luther was cha saying was, look, people, people they, the Catholic Church have brought in these indulgences. People can't buy their way into heaven. And, and of course, when the poor people couldn't buy their way into heaven, nobody cared. When the middle class couldn't afford to buy their way into heaven, nobody cared. But when the economy failed to the point where the princes couldn't afford to buy their way into heaven, and think of the parallels <laughs> of this with today, then we care. The herring migrated into the North Sea, and what happened there? The English began fishing them, and the Dutch began fishing them, and a, a wars between the Dutch and the English be began over the herring fisheries and the conflict that developed there. This is a very good illustration of, of, of what we're talking about here. So even though people say it's all about the money, we can say in this segment it's really all about the food. <laughs> well, ab absolutely, because, you know, and this is a very, very important food, or important point. Civilization... <laughs> Civilization, which means, you know, it's from the word civic, which is a city. This is my favorite phrase that I've created for farming. And then we have to get back to my next question on migrations, but go ahead. The, the comment I want to say is that there are no farms in the cities, but there are no cities without farms. Civilization, whatever, however you want to define it, develops because of a, an increase in the food supply. Surplus food is surplus time, and in that surplus time, you can create any kind of civilization you want. You've got time to build Gothic cathedrals. You've got time to build pyramids. And, and you've got time to create uh, all kinds of government monsters. And, and, um, but when, as we're seeing now, look what's happening. The price of, of uh, food is increasing, the price of gasoline is increasing, and suddenly the economy becomes more important than the environment, more important than global warming and all these other things. So we're seeing the same thing going on right now. So um, the, the people need to understand that, and that's why one of my opening comments to you was, it isn't necessarily the weather or climate events per se, but how they change the food supply. And speaking of the food supply, do you think that the cost of food is going up and the threat of what's happening to food is increasing because of cooling or because of warming or because of both or because of something else? It's really both. And, and it's also, it's also uh, again, focusing on the wrong issue. And, and this is the problem with today's world. Somebody gets, some academic gets a bee in their bonnet and they convince the whole world that that's the problem. And 99% of it is rubbish. What is the problem? And what is it that we're looking at that's wrong? Okay, one of the great achievements of the U.S., apart from the Constitution, 
uh, which is one of the, which is really the incredibly uh, advanced document, understanding human nature as it really is. But one of the achievements of the U.S. was that U.S. is the only country that effectively occupies those middle latitudes from 30 to 50 or 49, as it is, uh, which is a the major food producing area. The U.S. production of food is absolutely incredible and has and, and never been equaled in the history of the world, where you've got 2% of the population which are, are you know, statistically listed as farmers, as opposed to, say, 18% are rural, 2% of the population producing enough food to feed the other 98% with food left over to export. I mean, at the end of the Second World War, the, the U.S. was producing 52% of the world's food supply. That's profound. It is really profound, and and of course, I mean, it's one of the uh, it's one of the failures of the Bush administration was was uh, you know the farm subsidies and distorting the whole farm economy and everything else. But but it was that uh, uh, surplus food that allowed the U.S. to become the manufacturing and indust- industrial giant that it was, and as long as that was tempered by um, the. Uh, 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 um, adherence to the Constitution, it was fine. But now they're getting away from that. Now, back to your original question, um, or most recent question, (laughs) and and the answer is that the world produces enough food because of the advances in food production made primarily by the U.S., the world produces enough food to feed 26 billion people. There is no shortage of food supply in the world. Where did you get that number? Like well, how these are you... numbers that, that have been worked out by various people in, in agriculture. I worked with a guy in, in uh, the Department of Agriculture in Manitoba by the name of Ben Burke because um, we, we were working on um, f- storing food in the permafrost where it could be stored and then flown out to uh, wherever there was a, 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 an environmental disaster and, and also storing frozen water because water is always needed whenever there's a disaster. And, and, um, and of course, um, Dennis Avery. Okay. Yeah. These people have, have looked at these statistics. Now, here's the problem. In the developing countries, 60% of all the food they produce never makes it to the table. Why? Well, because of, of, of loss in the fields due to insects and disease and blight. Even in the U.S., even with the use of herbicides and insecticides, 30% of the crop is lost in the field. And then because of, of um, you know, really very crude harvesting techniques, the amount of grain that's lost in, in combining and so on, and then the amount of food that's lost when it's put in the, in the grain elevator due to, due to rust and, and to uh, other, you know, problems of mold, and, and, um, and then... Uh, lost in shipping, and then the amount of food that is lost in storage, the inability to store food efficiently. This is why the CFC issue and the ozone issue was such a huge thing. What do you mean the CFC issue? What does CFC mean? Well, CFCs are chlorofluorocarbons, and they were introduced to get rid of ammonia as the major form of refrigeration. I mean, a lot of people don't realize that the ability to freeze and store food created by a a fellow by the name of Charles Birdseye um, was an incredible breakthrough in in human ability to um, stabilize the food supply and store the food. I mean, one of the things that, that absolutely stunned me was when I was reading the Hudson Bay Company journals, um, they didn't realize that that food could be frozen and thawed, and then it was safe to eat. They didn't think they they stored their meat by putting it in fresh water. Well, have you ever seen beef when it's been hanging in fresh water for a while? <laughs> and 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 then one year there's an entry in the journal where they said, oh, we had a a, a fish that had been frozen all winter, and we thawed it out and ate it, and it was as sweet as the day it was caught. And they were absolutely stunned by this. So the, the concept of refrigeration of food, which reduced the loss of food in the developed world, which is why India and China and the, the developed world refused to sign or the Montreal Protocol banning CFCs. Talk a little bit about that. Well, one of the things that um, uh, has been going on in today's world, and we talked about the academics, and, and, and it, you know, somebody gets in a lab and they, they throw 
uh, something in with something else, and there's a reaction. And right away, that suddenly turns into, oh, it's unsafe to eat this, and it's unsafe to eat that. You shouldn't do this and shouldn't do that. It's extrapolated from incredibly simplistic um, research and, and also correlations. And um, so what happened was a couple of guys by the name of um, um, Sherwood and, and Molina in a lab dumped um, CFCs in with ozone and it destroyed the ozone. Now, it wasn't the CFC. It was the chlorine part of the ozone, or the CFC, I should say. And then they said, oh, well, you know, the, uh, the ozone levels are, are, are decreasing, so obviously it's the CFCs. But what was going on was that the ozone is formed at, at least 15 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, where the temperatures are minus 70 and colder, and and the pressure is uh, is virtually zero, and and they couldn't simulate those conditions in the lab. So to take what they done in the lab and simply extrapolate it up to the ozone layer was was scientific rubbish. But of course, by this time, the Greens had caught on to it. Oh, they, oh there is a hole in the ozone, and it's humans and CFCs. There was never ever any evidence that CFCs or chlorines were causing variation in the ozone. You know, I have to tell you, I'm one of those people that believed that. I know. And, and I'm one of those people that took that as being a fact. Well, here's, here's the thing. When I appeared before the Canadian Parliamentary Committee on the ozone and CFC issue, I pointed out to them that ozone is created by ultraviolet radiation, which comes from the sun. They assumed that the ultraviolet radiation coming from the sun was constant. Therefore, if you assume that, then you assume that the ozone creation is constant. So if you then measure a variation in the amount of ozone, you, de- you never look at, at the ultraviolet changes as the source. You look at, oh, it, and, and we're into that environmental hysteria. Oh, it must be something humans are doing. And here suddenly these guys from California have, have shown in the lab, oh, they have, yeah, the CFCs destroy the ozone. And that was suddenly transported up to 17 kilometers above the surface of the Earth. It's rubbish. And, 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 and now we know that ultraviolet radiation varies by as much as 200%. But in the meantime, they banned the CFCs. They, uh, you know, and by the way, when I appeared before that committee, the, the, I think it was Dow Chemical that produced the CFCs, never said anything. They knew what was wrong with the science, but they kept their mouth shut. Why? Because they'd already made their money off it, and they'd already had in place, they were the only company that were ready to bring in the replacement, which was eight CFCs, which are now turning out to be more problematic than the CFCs they replaced. Why? Why? Well, because H is the, is the uh, water part of it. Water, water vapor, water is... is, is um, is the most important of all the greenhouse gases of all the elements on the planet. That's why you and I have talked about changing the name of the planet from Earth to water. It, 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 it's it's uh, so critical. And what, what happens when NASA go to any other planet? What are they doing? They're looking for water because they assume that you have to have water for life. And and so, um, as I said, what the, the assumptions that were made with the, uh, with the ozone issue were, were absolute uh, scientific nonsense. And by the way, just to indicate the, the degree of, of insanity that occurred, they, they appointed a, 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 what he became known as, as the ozone czar in Manitoba, where I was living at the time. And he bragged to me one day before a committee that I was chairing that he could, he could simply shut down a farm just on his word that he could um, uh, fine a farmer, have a farmer fined up to $200,000, just on his word. For what? He didn't need any evidence. All he, all he had to do was show that the farmer had been using CFCs, and, and uh, bang, that was it. And, and, of course, anybody that in refrigeration knows the CFCs are four times more dense than air, that you release them from the can, they go down, they don't go up. And, and, of course, all of these things got completely ignored in that environmental hysteria. Well, the same thing is going on with the CO2 right now. And, and of course, um, as I said, uh, the, the ozone issue and the uh, CFCs and storage of food, and basically what India and China said at, in, in the debate on the Montreal Protocol, they said, look, you're telling us we can't have that refrigerant. But you have in, you have been able to uh, increase your food uh, storage by using it, and and uh, so you benefited from it. Now you're telling us we can't benefit from it. We we'll make a deal with you. 
you reduce your level and let us increase our level and, and uh, to, to um, level the playing field. And Canada, the U.S., and the rest of the developed world said, no, sorry, CFCs are gone. And this is another example of what Paul Dreesen has written about and spoken about so well, eco-imperialism, imposing our ecological value system on the developing world. And, of course, Mont uh, in, in India and China are part of the Montreal Protocol, but they were not required to implement any of the, uh, of the parts of it. And, and so it parallels the Kyoto, you know, it only applied to the developed nations. It's, it's all about punishing the developing nations. That's what all of these things are about. But as I said, the, the, free, the ability to refrigerate food uh, was a huge uh, breakthrough in in in, uh, in uh, human history, and uh, and of course um, that that's why I'm saying if you if you if you increase the ability to store food, if you increase the ability to uh, have an, an, it's not just the storage and and the uh, you know preventing the loss of food, but also the distribution of the food. I mean, one of the things that they're railing against is this globalism. But go into your supermarket today. And when you, where you've got fruits and foods from Chile and from I go in world. I go into both Trader Joe's and Whole Foods and I'm astonished how many of the fruits and vegetables are not from the United States of America. Oh, exactly. And and this is part of what's been happening with free trade. And it's wonderful. I mean the ability to uh, both preserve and transport and put that food in the market um, in in uh, edible qualities is just a remarkable um, achievements. Hold on a minute. On one hand, I get what you're saying. On another hand, it's very disconcerting that we're not able to grow locally and transport locally, which to me would be better protection than having to go outside the country for a basic food supply. I mean, there's something very disconcerting about that. I appreciate the capacity yep. of it. I'm yep. not putting down the fact that it's there. But what I'm telling you is it's very disconcerting that I'm not seeing more real food, fruits and vegetables from the United States of America when I live here. You've hit on a, the absolutely critical point. It parallels, of course, the oil, you know, being being uh, the U.S. becoming independent of foreign sources of oil. These ideas are popping up all over the place with globalization because the idea of, of free markets and free movements of stuff and, and um, Chile being, you know, third world countries being able to sell their foodstuffs into the U.S. and so on, yeah, there's, there's some general benefits to it, but it distorts markets, which is what you're raising, yeah. and it creates dependencies. Now, for example, I'll, I'll give you one example uh, that actually occurred. I mean, there are many, but um, Saudi Arabia forgets most of its fresh water from desalination, and it does that using its own oil supply, its own heat, because you need heat for desalination or desalinization, to whatever term you want to use. And, and Japan, back in the 80s, there were 300 super tankers a day going from Saudi Arabia into and the Middle East into Japan, and this and the Japanese said, "Well, what's it costing you to produce that water through desalination?" The Saudis said, "It's about eleven dollars for a thousand gallons." Japan looked at it and said, "Okay, we've got new regulations coming in. We can't. We have to flush out an oil tanker because a, a, an empty oil tanker uh, with dredge, with with." Uh, sediments of oil in it is a is a floating bomb okay so we've got to flush it out because we've got the rid of the gases so what we're proposing to do is on the southern island of japan where you get 200 inches of rainfall a year we'll fill those super tankers up with fresh water and we'll sell you that water at six dollars for a thousand gallons isn't that a good deal the Saudis' immediate response was, we do not want to become dependent upon a foreign nation for a primary resource, which, of course, is almost laughable in ignoring the fact that Japan is totally dependent upon the Saudis for the oil. And the Saudi and the Japan, by the way, sol solved some of their problems of oil, oil dependency by storing large quantities of oil. Now, they didn't have the land space to do it, so they built massive floating uh, rubberized containers in, in, in the oceans around Japan. Canada has long offered 
sell water to the U.S. and, and now uh, through the NAFTA. And, and then there's a place on the west coast of Canada called Ocean Falls. It was a far, or, sorry, a forestry com- community, and it, it died uh, because of the decline in the forestry industry. But there's a massive waterfall. That's the name of the town, Ocean Falls. The federal government said, you can bring in tankers, fill it up with water, and sell that water down to American cities in Southern California and places where they need the water. They didn't sell a drop because those communities were not going to become dependent on, on the primary resource of water from that commie pinko country up north. <laughs> and, and so, you know, this is another illustration. And, and the water issue underlines uh, this dependency. Same thing with the food supply. You know, one, again, think about back in the 30s. Where were the food lines? They were in the cities. They weren't in the countryside. The people in the countryside were able to uh, generally scrabble enough food together to survive. And, and um, in, in uh, many cities across North America, the, the cities passed bylaws allowing people to keep chickens and hogs in their backyard. And a lot of places, I know this because of Winnipeg, they've still got those, those bylaws on the books. Those were brought in so that the people could be self-sufficient because the external supply had failed. And so that speaks to your point about local sources, local supply. Yeah, it's becoming more of a dire imperative for future planning. This is something that people are just starting to become aware of. You see, in the 30s, what happened was, and we did it with our power systems, prior to the 1930s, Every community had its own little source of power, whether it was a little dam or whether it was, uh, you know, coal or whatever, oil or whatever it was. And then we started to bring in these big centralized grid systems. Yeah, I'm for the decentralization of energy power. Okay, but then, but then, how is how is that different than it, it's the concept? It's like it's like um, you know the supermarket coming in. And what happened? Every shopping center was built around one major um, supermarket, like Penny's, uh, Penny's or, or J.C. Penny or, or, or Walmart or whatever. And, and of course, all the mom and pop operations. Go and look what's happening in England right now. Main Street England is dying. Why? And there are people campaigning to keep the local shops open. Um, there's a woman's got a program on there where she goes in and helps little sh- local shops to keep their business going because Tesco comes in and sets up out on the edge of the town. Everybody drives out there to this massive free parking lot and they buy everything they can get. You see it with Walmart, the oppositions to Walmart. But these are these are are, are things that began with the dominance of of, of marketplace by these giant entities. And and uh, they have their benefit, lower prices, uh, cheaper, you know, they can dictate how by. Yeah, but Tim, it's lower prices at what cost and to exactly. how many people? But we're just starting to ask ourselves that. And we haven't even begun to ask it in the context of global food supply and global resources. There was an American economic forecaster by the name of Eric Halbronner, and he talked about this when he ta- talked about multinational corporations. And he said multinational corporations are the new nation states of the 21st century. They operate independent of the existing nation states. They basically, uh, they'll, they'll, like a parasite, put themselves where, wherever they can get the best deal. They'll operate out of whatever country. In fact, right now, Prudential, which is one of the largest insurance companies in the world, based in London, are planning to leave London because they're imposing regulations on them, and they'll just say, "Fine, we'll move to somewhere where we can do that." And 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 of course, um, the the country that has these places say, "Oh no, no, we'll do whatever you need to to stay here." Look what's going on in the U.S. The same thing. Uh, I watched it in North Dakota, where communities were were offering deals for companies to move from one town to another in order to maintain their community. So these sorts of dynamics are things that we need to, you know, long-term planning, we need to think about the implications of them. But, of course, then they're distorted by these overriding issues of environment and, and uh, energy that, that distort these other patterns. 
okay. and, and we're just simply not um, dealing with them. I want to go back to inventions that have come out of climate change and weather, like yeah. irrigation. Can you talk about how irrigation came about? If you talk to anthropologists, look at any anthropo- anthropological textbook, and, and that, by the way, anthropologists are allowed to talk about primitive people, but historians aren't, um, which, which shows that bias we talked about at the beginning. But um, you ask an anthropologist, what are the, the list of three major advances in human history? Um, two at the top, one is fire. And, and there was that movie made back in the 70s called Quest for, Fu- for Fire. <laughs> and, and the Vestal Virgins, their original job was to maintain the fire. Uh, because you you know to create fire was difficult and to keep it burning, and that's why the Olympic torch with the fire and all those sorts of things are built into our culture. But it, the fire allowed you to live and create microclimate and live in areas where you nor- wouldn't normally live. I mean, when I lived in in, in Winnipeg, uh, when you look at the uh, temperatures there, um, and and um, I got, again I got into trouble for this, but. If you if a if a terrorist wanted to destroy the city of Winnipeg, all you had to do was have three hand grenades, and you blew up the gas pipeline from the west, the oil pipeline and the oil pipeline from the west, the hydroelectric power lines from the north, and the water pipeline from the east. And if you did that at uh, minus thirty degrees, the city's frozen in an hour. In other words, without those um, energy um, uh, umbilical cords. The city simply couldn't exist, and certainly not on the scale that it does. And so fire allowed humans to expand and and, uh, survive in areas where they normally wouldn't uh, have been able to. The second one is is clothing. Okay, the introduction of clothing uh, is a microclimate, and um, it's interesting. I've done a lot of work with clothing companies producing uh, you know, more efficient, lighter clothing, clothing that doesn't sweat and perspire and all these other things. And, and that's been a huge uh, factor. And the third one is um, a, a, an attempt to deal with drought. I've already mentioned the, the impact of drought. Agriculture, that is sedentary agriculture, as opposed to hunter-gatherer. When we stopped hunter-gathering, uh, where if we were in a region where the weather wasn't good and the crops weren't good, we simply moved. Um, then we went to sedentary agriculture, that is sitting in one place and growing a crop. That made us totally dependent upon the weather conditions. And, of course, immediately that became the drought. Now, what happened was the Fertile Crescent, which essentially is is through um, modern-day Iraq, from uh, Israel across to modern-day Iraq in a curve, that's where modern-day agriculture, sedentary agriculture, began. And um, it Gradually, about 9,000 years ago, as a period of climate called the climate or the climatic optimum or the Holocene optimum or the hypsothermal, whatever you want to call it, uh, the, the global climate started to increase significantly. In fact, it warmed up to about three degrees Celsius warmer than it is at present, which gives lie to all of these claims about the dangers of warming. But anyway, as it got warmer, that region became increasingly drier. And in order to offset the decrease of precipitation, they uh, brought in water through irrigation. Now, of course, what it led to were, and this is always the thing with with activities, whatever you do, there is always a a reaction and a a side effect. It led to increasing salinity of the soils, and you can see that as occurred in California and the Imperial Valley and so on, to the point now where a lot of the soils are going to have to be flushed to get the salt out of them. And it also led to soil erosion, so that Baghdad, which is now, I believe, approximately 200 miles inland, was on the coast uh, 7,000, 8,000 years ago, and soil erosion has increased. And uh, But, of course, one of the differences is that irrigation, which was originally developed to uh, allow you to continue sedentary agriculture through a dry period, is, has been adapted into making the deserts bloom. That is to taking a truly naturally dry area and bringing in the water and creating uh, crops out of it. And I think that that's a great deal of what happened in Southern California. 
uh, when, when, when Greeley said, go west, young man, and look, you're looking for the land of milk and honey, they got to uh, California and say, oh, this is the land of milk and honey. Oh, no, there's not enough water. Well, we'll bring some water in. We'll make it the land of milk and honey. And, of course, irrigation in Southern California is a huge uh, situation. And, and, and so there's a difference between irrigating desert as opposed to irrigating an area that normally will produce some vegetation but has periodic droughts. Uh, one of the things that um, uh, Gaddafi was doing in the desert of, of, of Libya was pumping groundwater out that had been put there 10,000 years earlier during the Ice Age when, when the desert was, was um, uh, vegetated and, and green. And um, he pumping that water up and, and creating a, uh, a you know huge gardens, and it was a, an, an incredible comment. British reporter said, "You're pumping the water out at such a rate that in, that uh, the water will be all, all gone in 30 years." And Gaddafi said, "So will I." So I mean, he he, he was a horrible politician, but brutally honest. And and uh, and of course, so that's the change in irrigation. But irrigation was. A, a, a huge technical advance in the precipitation area. What do you see now in terms of the potential for climate change and or weather impacting the need to migrate? First of all, we need to separate weather and climate. Weather is uh, our daily events, uh, you know, sometimes two and three day events, like a storm system going through. And those impact specific events in history. I mean, we, we can think about the storm that delayed Caesar's invasion of Britain and allowed the Brits to prepare somewhat. They couldn't overcome it. But and then would you say that weather is transitory? Oh, oh definitely. OK, so the weather, the weather from and I mentioned that earlier with farmers, they never they never take this year's weather as, as a measure of what what's going to happen next year. It, it, it varies a great deal. And, and the, the degree of variability changes, and that's right. what's happening right now. But uh, individual weather events, uh, for example, um, there was a storm in, in 1588 that traveled. It was a massive storm, and it's been uh, literally weather maps created based upon the ship's logs from the Spanish Armada and from the English fleets. And tracking that storm up the English Channel, it destroyed the Spanish fleet. And in, in fact, to the point that every time the wind blew, it was against the Spanish, which allowed Elizabeth, the Protestant, to say that the storm was proof that God was on the Protestant side and not the Catholics. <laughs> and and um, so it, it really turned the course of history, that storm. And, um, and then there were later events, a storm in 1703, that uh, Daniel Defoe took three years, the writer of Robinson Crusoe. He traveled around England recording the impact of that storm. It was estimated 200 ships sank in the North Sea in the single storm. And, and uh, it changed the pattern of people doing things and, and everything else. 1709, there was a, a, a massive frost across Europe. It killed a, an estimated three-quarters of all the walnut trees in England. Now, the walnut trees have been introduced by the Romans and had become the tree of uh, wood of choice for cabinet building. But after, uh, prior to that storm, the walnut producers had got the government to ban the import of the new mahoganies from the Americas and from uh, Asia, uh, particularly but from the Americas. I want you to get back and explain climate distinction. Yeah, okay, just finish the wood story. Because um, and after 1709, of course, the, the, car, the furniture builders needed a wood to replace walnut, and so they, they, they um, got the um, bans against mahogany lifted, and mahogany became the wood of choice um, in the Georgian period. And, and walnut still, by the way, is, is, is a sign of aristocracy. Look at the panels in your Rolls Royce. Um, they're always walnut veneer. That that's part of that pattern, but anyway, it, that changed the whole course of of, of uh, furniture building and, and around the world. But 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 the the climate issue, climate is the average of the weather. So you take the weather from day to day, and then and as I mentioned with the farmers, they know from over the years that the last uh, the risk of frost drops significantly after May the tenth. So they then taking that long term average. The question is, how, long, how much does the climate have to change 
before that May 10th date shifts enough that the farmers will say, no, we're losing crops too often now to frost. We need to shift our date of planting. Now, what happened in the 80s and, and, and then and then into the 90s with the with the warming that was going on, um, and it was due to the sun, not to CO2. But farmers started to uh, plant. Some of them started to plant earlier, because uh, in Canada, where we're marginal, if you could get your crop in earlier, then you reduce the risk of losing uh, your crop to frost at the end of the growing season. It's the frost-free season that really determines the growing cro- uh, production in Canada and the northern U.S. So if you could change that by a week, you, you reduce your uh, crop loss risk significantly. What about the migration, though? I want to cut in here, and I want you to definitely answer my question about <laughs> okay. climate yeah. and migrations. And, yeah, okay. okay. Um, now, there have been three, there are three major racial groups. There is the Negroid basically originally in Africa. There is the Mongoloid in Asia, and then there is the Caucasoid in Europe. According to current anthropological uh, understanding, the center of human uh, evolution is in East Africa, particularly centered around the Olduvite Gorge, and um, that as the human population grew, it expanded out and migrated out but it was restricted from expanding across into Europe and Asia by the Sahara Desert. But over the centuries, as the weather, as the climate changes, um, you go through ice ages. And as the ice sheets form in the north, the Sahara Desert goes from being a desert to being a vegetated area. Now, the most recently that that happened was about 20,000 years ago. And um, I I talked about that just briefly just now. But as the uh, Ice Ages uh, occurred, then the the Sahara becomes passable. And humans um, come come down, are are now bipedal. They start to migrate um, following the food supply, which is in the trees and and the animals that are feeding, the small animals that are feeding off the trees. A big game, um, it was never a major source of food supply. It certainly wasn't among North American aboriginals. But anyway, the, 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 um, the anthropology says then the, the greening of the Sahara allows the, Europe, the human race, the Negroids, to spread across. Now, of course, the question then is the change of skin color and change of, of phys- physiology to the environmental conditions Skin color, of course, is a function of the ability to absorb or reject ultraviolet radiation for the production of vitamin D. And, um, and uh, that a lot of people don't understand that, and that's why using sunblockers uh, has created so many problems, because without enough vitamin D, humans uh, get rickets, bones. They get many things. We did a whole piece on that. Yeah, okay, so you know but, about that. Yeah. Okay, the, the interesting one, of course, is, is the uh, is the. Uh, Mongoloid, uh, and and of course the coloration of mongoloids go from uh, almost white to very dark, but not negroid. Now you get some, uh, of course you're going to get some mixing going on uh, through the Middle East, and uh, and of course when you start to look at the people in Australia migrating there through the land bridge. I want to take you back because I want you to answer my question. I know that you have to establish many, many layers and levels of understanding with how things connect. And this is all very dynamic and necessary, but I want you to explain, this is the theme of this show, this segment, how climate change is impacting and connected to mass migrations. Talk about the Great Migration. The three great migrations in human history, the first was the the Negroid race out of Africa, being able to cross, because of climate change, being able to cross the Sahara into Europe and Asia. The, there, because of, of uh, adaptation to the um, climate conditions, particularly skin color and, and other physiological features, um, you, you create the, the two other major racial groups, and that is the uh, uh, Mongoloid in Asia and the Caucasoid in Western Europe. The second great migration occurred during the Ice Age again because now with the lowering of sea levels, people could migrate across to Australia 
and people could migrate across the Bering Straits into North America. And, of course, then they migrate uh, surprisingly rapidly down through into um, North and South America. Now, I do think that there is an issue we've talked about here that, that, that just to mention briefly, and that is early man in the oceans. I think people were traveling on the oceans more than anthropology gives credit. But anyway, the, the third great migration, so, that, so the second one is, is the Mongoloids out of Asia and into, um, into North America and South America. The third great migration was the Caucasoid migration, which began... Um, around uh, 1000 AD, you've got the, um, the Vikings, for example, migrating. They went, most of them went east, the whole uh, Romanov Empire and, and that, that migration there. But particularly by the 16th and 17th centuries, the migration to the New World. And, uh, and of course, um, the, that, that brings us up to uh, the, the current situation. And, and th- those are the three great migrations. Do you see that there will be a next big migration coming in our lifetime? Well, there is, there is that. That is occurring now, but it's occurring for different reasons. You see, those, those migrations, one of the great changes that's occurred is that, that humans were passive uh, recipients of the climate because it affected their food supply and therefore they were forced to move. That's the concept I talked about earlier about environmental and climatic determinism. What's happened now because of the advances in science and technology and the ability, we and, and it goes to the, the issues we talked about, about pollution and humans becoming an active uh, changer of of, of environmental conditions, we've gone from being passive to being active. So migrations now are more about, people are economic migrants, more far more than they are climatic migrants. Now, the climate might get bad enough in an area that people have to leave there. I mean, you, you saw it in the U.S. with, with the, uh, with the uh, depression and, and the droughts in, in the Great Plains. And the migration of people, um, the, you know, the Oklahomers and so on, and 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 uh, but but more and more, the the migrations now are driven by economies, and this is another uh, change in human history um, that uh, we are less affected by climate because of clothing, because of energy, because of technology, um, and able to live in areas that we previously would be pushed out of much much earlier. Um, than um, than before. So economic migration has become the dominant issue of the 20th and 21st century and will essentially remain that way. Do you have any concerns about cooling occurring in the next 10 to 15 years with respect to impacts on agriculture and living? Yes, the whole world's preparing for warming, but the cooling historically uh, has been the greatest uh, cause of well, drought and, and, and cooling. But if you're going to consider just temperature, and I do think we need to shift to precipitation uh, as, as a much more primary source of study, but if you're going to, going to look at temperature, cooling is a, has a much more negative impact. And for example, if you, if you reduce about, uh, the world's temperature by about one degree Celsius, um, you effectively reduce uh, Canada, for example, half of its agricultural pr- productive land is, is out of current production. Now, technology might allow us to continue that with genetic modification, which, of course, a lot of people are opposed to, but you could then produce crops that would be able to survive in those new uh, conditions. Let's not even go here. The reason is not to silence you. I am diametrically opposed to you in this, and that does not mean I wouldn't do a piece on it. I think we should. I just don't want to divert, because it deserves its own piece. The thing is, one of the things that you've got to think about is, look what's happening now. Environment is an important issue, but where is it in on the list of concerns for the American uh, voter? I can speak for the American voter now because I'm here and I'm in touch with people all over America. I'm not saying I have the ultimate pulse, but I will tell you that there is a certain segment of the population and it's not just, quote, the greenies that are extremely concerned about genetically modified food and organisms infiltrating the entire agricultural supply into all our markets, disrupting regular and organic food 
and altering what's going into our system. So I think more people are catching up and are becoming aware. Okay. As I say, we'll not debate about that. I, I yeah, know no, no, I just wanted to respond to your question. Yeah, Even no, I know, but there was a massive study done in, in um, eight different countries that showed that the, the less than 10% were concerned about genetically modified foods. But the, anyway, we'll leave that. No, I, I'm but, but, sure but, but, that but that's point, true. But here's the point that I want to make, Kim. The point I'm making is when the climate pressures become great enough, people will resort to whatever will help them survive. And if it gets, if we plan for warming and it gets cold and we need to adapt quickly, people will say, to heck with the, the concerns about genetically modified food. It will allow us to continue here. That's been human history. That's the point about it. Well, I mean, age. that's like a basic survival modality. Course, you know, people but, will do what they have to do to survive. Exactly. It doesn't mean it's optimal, but they'll do what they have to do to survive, which is a whole other question. But it isn't, though, because because that was where we started out, you see. I said to you about environmental determinism and climatic determinism. Right. And, and of course, what you're saying is, yeah, at some point, they, the, the, the pressures will become that great. And the question is, where is that line? And what I'm saying to you, it has changed because of our abilities to adapt and and uh, and adjust with technology and all of these other things and and so that that isn't going to change but the point i'm also making to you is that the world governments are preparing for warming when the greatest challenge is cooling and and, and the point i'm making to you is that you know what, what happens in canada when when we're threatened i know for example that um, they when they brought in canola into uh, the northern prairie provinces, and then they uh, then they brought in. Well, we're losing. We've got soil erosion, so they started doing zero till. They stopped plowing. Well, that reduced the rate at which the soil temperatures increased. So they lost two weeks on the growing season, which meant then they couldn't grow canola anymore. So what did they do? They brought in from Poland a Polish variety of canola that could grow in a shorter growing season. This is this is what's been going on, and and so, but nonetheless, cooling is a greater threat to food production, and and uh, if you want to see that back in the 70s when I started studying climate, global cooling was the consensus. The CIA, the, for the first time, governments were doing studies on climate change and its impact on the the uh, political and social conditions, and the CIA produced at least two reports that I know of. Bill Dando, who was the head of geography at the University of North Dakota that I knew and talked to uh, uh, frequently, he got $2 million to study how the cooling that was planned was coming, and we're talking the 70s, would reduce world wheat production and what effect that would have on the stability of governments and, and, and world stability, which, of course, is what the CIA were a charge to, uh, to determine. And, and so um, global cooling and the impact uh, is, is much, much uh, more of a threat than warming. The way to do it, the way to deal with it is you prepare for cooling, and if it warms, the ad ad adaptation is much easier. But if, it, if you prepare for, for warming and it cools, you, you can find yourself in a corner and be forced into the technologies that a lot of people don't like, don't trust, and, and, uh, and so on that we talked about. That was apparent to me in my interview with Don Easterbrook about preparing for warming. Yep. He actually sees that there's a cooling going on, even though the reports are that it's warming everywhere. But the preparation is exactly what you're talking about, which is that you should prepare for cooling, and then if it warms, well, so be it. Well, and I've said that for, for 25 years. There you go. But any, anyway, the migrations now... And the, the things that trigger them are, are, are different than they were in the past uh, because of this transition from humans being an act or passive recipient of environmental and climate changes into being a, uh, a uh, um, active uh, causer of change. I mean, think, think about the, th the things that are going on with people talking about geoengineering and, and causing, um, uh, you know, uh, causing climate change, stopping the, the warming, or as they did back in the 70s, talked about stopping the cooling. And um, these, these are insanity if you don't know uh, what, what the mechanisms are or how they're, um, you know, you, you're far better to do nothing.
I agree with you. And the geoengineering projects yep. have been going on so long. The stuff they're spraying into the air is so virulent and so horrendous. They have absolutely no idea what they're doing to the That's food right. supply, our ability to breathe. Animals get this and take this in. It's absurd. It's actually horrifying. Yep. But I really want to thank you for coming on the show. And I know you're very passionate and I'm very passionate. And there's so much to talk about. One of the things I love about bringing you on is you're so committed. And even though you're very passionate and, you know, you have a lot of things to say about a lot of things, tying them all together, which is a big job. You're still open for continued discussion. I like that about you. And I so appreciate who you are and everything you've been through to bring forth this kind of dynamic understanding about things. And I really look forward to having you on the show again. Thank you for the kind comments, and um, I will try and continue to keep an open mind. Thank you, Kim. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we have been talking with, listening to, and learning from Dr. Tim Ball. If you would like to contact him or read more about him, you can reach him by going to drtimball.com, D-R-T-I-M-B-A-L-L.com. He has thousands of articles that will be coming on the site, and so far a few hundred. We really appreciate you being here. Thank you so much.